me a stinky. That's funny. I love that kind of stuff. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Where's Dale? That's hello? what I want. No, I'm kidding. Um, hi. Hey, folks. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Uh, we did a live stream. Um, there is those of you who wonder why we're talking about Dale Kingsmill. Uh, Dale Kingsmill helped us moderate our uh, last Patreon live stream, which was really good because we post, um, I think, like once a month. I don't know how often we do it. I don't, uh, we post, uh, hey, everybody, if you have questions for the live stream, let us know. And we do Patreon exclusive live streams. And our friend our, and YouTube neighbor, Dale Kingsmill, moderates those. So it's really very useful for us to have somebody who acts as sort of like an interlocutor for the community. And it makes the, um, Andrew Stockton, so do we. It makes, it makes the live stream more like a conversation. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah, hey, everybody, this is our second live Q&A for the MCDM RPG. I am joined by our lead designer, James Centrocasso. So finally, when people ask questions, I'm like, I don't know, man, ask James. He's, he's right. Don't. He's right here. <laughs> Warhouse Bart, I thought that, saw that. Thank you for the three bucks. Um, yeah. So anyway, Hello. what's up, folks? You, you, I, uh, uh, oh, I, are we tired? Mika Zuki? I mean, I, I feel wide awake. I've got lots of caffeine. Um, so it may just be the, uh, un, uncalibrated expectations. I, we were, I was completely fried last Friday. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how much of this live stream is going to be us re-answering questions we've already answered. So if you ask a question and we don't answer it, that, it, it, that probably means that, an, that question's been asked a thousand times already. And you can just go to the Discord. There are tons of people in our Discord that, have, that, that already know how the game works for various reasons. And they are very happy to kind of talk about it and educate people. Um, yeah. So, but this is a Q and A. So, um, so a ask questions if if you otherwise we just sit here staring at chat. Actually, James, uh, do you know what I was doing before <laughs> yeah. we went live? Uh, were you? Well, uh, I don't. I don't want to say anything in case it gives stuff away. Uh, what were you doing? Oh. <laughs> I was um, editing the lore for the Cobalt Tower. Oh, nice. Excellent. Yes, yeah. that's going to be the adventure yeah. that our patrons are going to get uh, in the playtest packet that is hopefully coming to them before the end of the year. Awesome. Yeah. You want to hear it? Sweet. I do. Yes. Let's hear about how this adventure fits well, into Vasaloria. This is, this is as far as I got. Oh, okay. But you should be able to see the, mm -hmm. the thing. And it, it's going to require, I think, uh, somebody... One, two, three, not it. Doing a find and replace, um, because I think I replaced an NPC here. So this is what I got. That's fine. Easy Once, to do. an ancient human empire built great marvels of magic and technology. One example is the Tower of Tempered Time, in what would, millennia later, become southwestern Vasloria, north of Sealton Heath. A vast tower of clocks. Vast might be overstating it. A vast tower of clocks designed not only to track the passage of time, but also shape it, control it. The tower fell first into disuse, then ruin, along with the empire that built it. Only the wealthy and well-traveled in Vasloria are even aware clocks exist. Because it's a clock. Somebody in Vasloria would see clocks as like a steampunk technology, right? It's something they have in capital, but that, that, te that technology is very slow to migrate across the Bale Sea. <clears throat> so the locals have, for hundreds of years, referred to the ancient ruin as the Tower of Coins and Swords as the circular faces of the clocks look like coins to them and the hour and minute hands like swords. For thousands of years, the tower remained a forgotten curio until Tace, a local wizard of great repute, explored it and ventured to reactivate the ancient magics. He was, it seems, partially successful, activating the tower's defenses and retreating, leaving only a note nailed to the door. Do not enter under any circumstance. The locals revere Tace too much to disobey. Then a kobold warmonger, an operator, braved the tower. Praying to his dragon patron, he gained the insight taste lacked, and the tower lives again. So now I just got to edit that dude's name into here and give the part about the... So, anyway. Awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to monologue at, I think at that's all great. you folks, but I... Well, you can... And it's also, you can see how, like, that tower is like... It ha anything like that in Vasloria would have to be immeasurably ancient, right? Because they just don't... They're, they're a 13th century, basically, uh, culture technology. Um, is everybody losing their minds on 3 million? It's pretty extraordinary. Um, it's pretty <laughs> crazy. Um, yeah, exactly. There's a, uh, there did are you see any good, good questions, questions James? here. There, 
Yeah, so there was one about, um, we've talked a lot about combat, and somebody was like, hey, can you tell us how skills and other things work um, uh, that you've designed so far, right? So some some parts of the system we're still working on, and you know everything we talk about here is caveated with uh, everything still in development, and it could change, right? Um, but I would say that one of the things that I was doing right now was working on a system for complex tests, which is sort of our version of skill challenges, if you're familiar with those from 4th edition, and other games um and i was also working on just kind of skills in general so right now um our skills are very similar to what you see in a lot of d20 fantasy games you roll your dice you add some modifiers higher is better and you're trying to hit a target number right um and if you do you succeed and if you don't you fail um, so that's sort of the basic ways of how that works. It's flexible enough that you can mix and match. Um, you know, you have skills and characteristics. Your characteristics are broad, like ability scores. And those are things like might and agility and endurance, reason, intuition, right? Um, you add one of those. And if you have an applicable skill, you get a bonus from that as well that you add, right? Now, it might be that you can mix and match things. So if you are intimidating somebody, um, you could make a, a presence uh, intimidate test and add your presence characteristic and your intimidate skill um if you are using your force of personality right getting real low and in their face and and talking like this and staring them right in the eye getting them to back down um or it could be that if you are you know um uh intimidating them with your strength maybe you're cracking a walnut in your bare hand as you speak to them um, maybe that is a might intimidate test right and you're using your might characteristic instead of your presence characteristic so th those are sort of the basic of how you make a test to begin with in a complex test all of the heroes are working together towards a common goal so one of the things i just did was create this example of a complex test where it's like the heroes had to cross the infinite desert um to get to a city to warn it like hey you're under attack right and and the whole point of the test is are you going to make it there well before this uh, marauding army, right, led by a tyrant shows up and be able then to, when you get there, prepare the city's defenses and you'll be better prepared for battle? Or are you going to show up around the same time or are you going to show up, oh boy, the invasion has started and we need to help, right? Um and so the tests that you make are, it's basically the players saying, this is how we would work together to cross this desert quickly. And like, hey, maybe I'm going to try to, uh, while we're, we're moving here, craft everybody a pair of sand shoes that distribute their weight, right? And it could be that, like, I'm going to use my knowledge of the desert to find shortcuts. I'm going to be a lookout. I'm going to tie a rope to my waste and make a might test to drag everybody out uh sorry got a frog in my throat here <coughs> that's okay uh and so um essentially you want to achieve a certain number of successes on those individual tests before either you get a bunch of failures or a timer runs out right so you have so many attempts to make before it's like well hey guess what you took too long, the army is there anyway. So you can't be careful in the test, right? There needs to be some drama and time pressure and things like that. That's the basics of, of how complex tests work. So I thought I'd reveal that in, in response to that question. Yeah, uh, it's a really powerful framework that lets, us do, lets you do lots of stuff. Um, and one of the things that we found with skill challenge, like skill challenges are well, are from fourth edition, but they've been around since the nineties. We used to call them extended tests. Um, I worked on a couple of different Star Trek RPGs that had them. There were a lot, tons of games in the nineties had these things that are like, I think um, uh, over the edge or um, there was some RPG that I think oh, there's yeah. called them montage scenes, right? Because they are, yes. they are very, very great at simulating that kind of montage um, cinematic you know, everybody, everybody working together with some, you know, Kenny Loggins music playing over the background, try to build something or make some crazy progress. And, and everybody on the team has a way to contribute. The problem with skill challenges in fourth edition was I think they were a little undercooked as far as the design goes. And uh, just a yes. couple of tweaks, a couple of real simple tweaks gave them teeth and made them robust. Um, but it was also very challenging to people because I noticed that like we sort of see the same thing with negotiation. This might just be on a table by table basis where people are like, do my players know that they're in a skill challenge? And I was like, that's a weird, that always seemed like a weird question to me because that's like saying, do they know they're in a combat? 
It's like this is a this is yep. a this is a mechanical framework. It's a mechanical framework. How 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 would it work if you didn't tell them right? Like you know, um, same thing with negotiation. Like it's it's a mechanical framework. It has rules. If the players don't understand, if the players don't understand what it is, how the mechanics work, how could they possibly play the game? Um, but I, I definitely got the sense that there were some people who felt like you know, I think I think sometimes when you look at negotiation or you look at skill challenges, you imagine that they're an omni tool. They're not. Right, like most most things, most role playing that happens in a normal session, you just role play. You're trying to, like I said, like trying to convince the librarian to look, you look at a specific book, you know, because it's uh, important to uh, the thing you're hunting down. That's just a, a, some role playing and maybe a role. That's it, right? So I think people looked at the skill challenge framework and they started imagining it as something that would handle anything. And so in that context, yes. it felt weird telling the players about. The fact that all of this stuff is now a game mechanic, but it's not, it's not, it's a, it's a pretty, it is, it's very powerful, but it's just a thing that helps you solve this one type of, um, one type of problem. Also, by the way, yeah. um, just, I hope everybody, everybody listening to this, uh, also propagate this out. Super chats are no guarantee of answers. Like I, if I, I would think like I would save, save your super chats for just, I approve of what you folks are doing and want to support you. Here's, here's five bucks or whatever. If indeed anybody would be motivated to do such a thing. Um, because it gets really gross when people think that their super chat has bought them an answer. Uh, uh-uh. there's no way to buy answers. We, we give them out freely and somewhat idiosyncratically and arbitrary. Um, yeah. Do I talk? Thomas Friedman says, do you talk with other designers to see if your systems are too similar? Uh, nope. No, I've never, I've never, I've never, um, I, I, every game I've worked on, um, especially like the big AAA video games. There have been, there's always, there's always stuff we're excited by and then some other game announces and looks like it's doing the same thing and people on the team, typically what I would consider like junior members of the team start freaking out. They're like, oh my God, they're, they're, and I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're going to do it our way, right? We're going to do it our way and, and no one else can do it our way, right? So at the end of the day, just believe, believe in your chops, believe in your vision, see it through the end and trust that the audience, the audience will follow. Um, so there are a lot of really good questions in here. Once again, once again, we're getting really good questions. Um, yeah. So, uh, Ethan Ma asks, I think we, I mean, we, it's, it's tricky because it's hard to tell of all the questions we've answered a million times. It's hard to tell which ones maybe we should dip back into. Um, now that the cosmic die has been thrown out, this is something we covered in the Patreon. (laughs) Have you considered a mechanic that will make this game explicitly fantasy? It's the heroic resource, Right. Um, it's one of the things like there was a point in development where we had we had the cosmic die, heroic resources, and surges, which were a special facing on your die that powered up some of your things. And over the course of weeks, we weren't we weren't full time on the game at this point. It shouldn't it wouldn't have taken that long if we were, but over the course of weeks, we started to realize that just heroic resources could do a lot of this stuff. And it was the of all the things we liked, it was the thing we're like, not cutting that. We are definitely not cutting that. Um uh James, you got any questions you like? Yeah, there's a good question about uh, the negotiation system uh, in, in question of how will blackmail work? Bringing up a pitfall yeah, in a threatening a way question. could potentially incentivize co- cooperation. Um, will there be rules to handle that kind of thing? So I, negotiation is uh, much like you know complex tests and skill challenges are only meant for specific kinds of things, right? That you have one role to resolve something. Uh, in my experience, something like blackmail is only going to work for a certain amount of time, right? And negotiation is sort of built to create a lasting agreement with somebody, whereas blackmail, it's like, if you're going to do that, it's not exactly... Well, first, it's not the most heroic thing, but it's definitely a thing players do, right? It's definitely going to come up. Um, yeah. And I think in in that case, it'd be like, well, this probably stops the negotiation. They may do what you want them to do for now. They may attack you, right, and say, hey, this is this is not what I want. Um, or they may do what they want, what you want for now, and then it may result in later they're going to backstab you, right? That kind of thing. So we may end up uh, addressing that in a sidebar or that sort of thing. But I don't think the purpose of negotiation is to help help you effectively blackmail someone right um no so, but i uh, like although so there, there, i would there, imagine a game game in capital right is going to have blackmail <laughs> yeah 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 so i uh, so it's a really good question and i'm glad folks are i'm glad folks are thinking about these things complexly um because we want to we, no, we don't just want to answer these questions we want the design to support the answer um 
So there's a section in the rules on negotiation that talks about the threat of violence, right? And it's like, look, great. Your, your hero's armed to the teeth, right? Whether you're armed with steel or spell, that's on a case-by-case basis, you know, or teeth or whatever. So the threat of violence is always implicit. If you, if you make it explicit, that's not a negotiation, right? Do this or I'll kill you. That's not a negotiation, right? Um, it's sort of the opposite. So blackmail is much closer to do this or I'll kill you. That's not a negotiation. However, um, the types of NPCs you might want to blackmail, you know, I, I, actually, I don't know how many of them the types you negotiate with, but let's imagine you wanted to negotiate with an NPC in Adventure who had the negotiation stats. Because remember, it's, I, I, I personally imagine that only about one NPC per adventure, 32 to 64 pages, you know, one, one, one NPC per level, um, you know, is somebody that you would bother negotiating with in the first place. The fact that that NPC has the things they don't like anybody bringing up for whatever reason, it shames them, makes them angry, whatever. The process that you would have to go through to learn that which is not part of the negotiation, right? That's role-playing, investigation, research, talking to people. Like, what do we know about this person? We're getting ready for the negotiation. We know it's coming. So let's see if there's anybody. This We've already done this in in one of the sessions James ran, where we were talking to a local noble, and she was being very weird and cryptic with us, and we realized we were in a negotiation. And so we started asking the NPCs we knew who worked for her, like what was going on and what they knew. So we were digging. We were trying to get some information. That process is the process of blackmailing somebody, right? <laughs> it, that is the process of blackmailing somebody. I'm going to do a digging, I'm going to mount a digging operation on this person and see if there's anybody they love that we can hold for ransom. Is there any, is there any secret they have that we can threaten to out? That's not a negotiation, but the same process of research and digging that you would go through in order to win a negotiation is the process of blackmailing somebody. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I love that. <laughs> um, and I think you'll be able to you'll be able to do that. And I imagine, you know, Matt and I are just getting into crafting and research systems now. But, uh, you know, are there ways we know there are ways to research um, creating resources for yourself, like floating castles and potions and uh, magic swords and suits of armor. Right. But uh, there probably are also then ways to research lore. And if there are ways to research lore, there's probably ways to do the kind of research Matt is talking about, social research into people's backgrounds and stuff like that. So cool. Love it. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so there are some good questions here uh, that are about, uh, in terms of like uh, the heroic resources, um, and it was, uh, so it was actually a question that somebody asked way up the stream that was in terms of what is something that has surprised me uh, and and surprised us when we were designing it, right? In terms of like, wow, uh, I didn't think this was going to turn out this way or, or turn out this well. And Matt, I know you have an answer about a thing we sort of did with the condo or the elementalist um, that I was also surprised by. But I, one of the things that I think was a good epiphany moment for me was when we were working on the operator, Matt had this great idea for how the resource could work. And that kind of cracked everything open for how all of the different resources could work. And we could have a lot of fun designing these classes. And for me, the operator, the idea that the operator has a resource called power, right? Where they are managing this power between, so the operator is our mech class, right? And this may end up in the core, it may not, but they have this big, suit uh of armor called a frame right that they wear and the armor has different pieces it can have chest piece and leg pieces and arms and a head um and you can swap out different pieces for like hey this chest piece shoots a beam of light right um and this chest piece is going to make me more powerful at like lifting up things uh these arms shoot off and become rocket punches that i can punch people with uh these arms are good for crushing rocks right Um, This one has a drill. Uh, And so those different things uh, uh, that you can swap in, then you have this resource power that it doesn't really go up or down so much as you're allocating it to different pieces of the suit, right? And hopefully the math will come out that you'll just 
never have enough for each piece of your suit to be at full power, right? Um, or maybe you will, but it'll last a short time and then it goes back to normal, right? And so that kind of th idea of like, okay, all power to my legs because I need to be able to move as fast as possible right now or all power to the head because I want to be able to scan this whole environment. That is something that, uh, that's a mechanic that Matt came up with that I was like, this is going to be awesome. Well, this game is going to be amazing. Well, in point I of fact, it's a like classic that. mechanic from dozens of different games. Um, it's sure, just something sure. I haven't yeah, yeah. seen. It's something, right, like X-Wing, like every, like, not only is that in, like, every X-Wing TIE Fighter game, it's in Star Citizen, which yeah, I yeah. might be streaming tonight with Greg from How to Drink. We'll see. We'll find out. Ooh, sweet. Um, like, you can hear them say it in 1977 Star Wars. Right when they're when they're doing the attack on the Death Star and they go into the trench run, they're like they literally say um, shields to double front, right? They're 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 literally yeah. like which I, I loved. It's such a great moment, little tiny piece of of lore that they just throw out there, right? The notion of and I remember playing um, the legendary FASA Star Trek RPG, the first officially licensed Star Trek RPG, where kind of the only. The only fun part of that game was the uh, the that feeling of the bridge crew all desperately trying to argue with each other about who gets the power, right? So they can keep, you know, the doctor wants life support, right? But the 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 weapons guy wants all power to phasers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, the operator. Uh, yeah, the operator was. I just had the bit between the teeth, and I, we knew it was funny because the original idea of the operator was that it would manage heat, right? That that would be its heroic resource. Yes. Um, and in that context, heat would probably be a negative resource like strain for the talent. And keep in mind that we don't think the operator is core. Very unlikely the operator is going to be in the core rules. Not impossible, just very unlikely. Um, which means you would probably see it like on the Patreon before, and then eventually in another product somewhere. But then when James and I were going back and forth on other, other class design, and we were talking, we, we spent a lot of cycles just pounding and pounding our heads against how should heroic resources work. In that discussion, I was like, aha, it shouldn't be heat. It should literally just be power, right? You are managing your power allocation, which is classic game design. Tons of games use this stuff. Um, and I actually am I'm looking at the operator prototype. Um, it says, yeah, it says power is your heroic resource, your routines right? They're like subroutines running in your frame. And keep in mind, when we say a mech, we don't mean like, um, we don't mean like, uh, <laughs> I'm going to show my age here. We don't mean like Robotech. Or like we mean more like uh, right. the, 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 the loader, the lift loader from Alien, Aliens, right? That yes. kind of thing. If you go online and you look up Evolve, Lennox, L-E-N-N-O-X, that concept art is what inspired me. And that concept art is an original Jason Hauer, Hauer, Jason Hauer, Jason has an hour design. He's our art director. Um, so it felt, it felt reasonable to use that as inspiration. Um, and there's like, so you have, uh, I had, I came up with like three different frames and these would be like subclasses for the operator. Right. Um, and I don't know, we don't, how, how, can you switch frames and is it like a kit? We didn't have a kit design back then. So it, m maybe not, maybe these really are like subclasses. And, and if you can, you know, if, if you know how to operate one, it doesn't mean you know how to operate the other. Um, and you have like here, so the the beam frame right has um yeah and so you have these routines and every routine goes into a module right and so like your chest module your arm module your head module your legs modules and you can the idea being you can like swap things out um and they take different amounts of power uh so there's like the the beam frame has uh, a heroic one of its heroic routines is the mineral fragmenter because the idea is these are dwarven dwarven um, mining tools that they built, right? So everything we did for the operator, I had to contextualize in the sense of like, what would a dwarf engineer call this thing, right? They wouldn't call it a laser blaster. They would call it a mineral fragmenter, right? Um, and it has a note that says, requires a minimum of two power persistent, right? So it just goes, and you just turn it on and you leave it on, right? And every round it does its thing, like witch bolt sort of. Um, and it, put, it does power and it pushes people away. Um, and it's a, it's a chest routine so it goes in your chest module so that tells you it's a beam that shoots out from your chest as opposed to like um, the fast response support frame has a repair beam in its head module right and it says as a maneuver target an ally within five squares they can spend a recovery to heal right so you literally go like that and you you fix that person um anyway yeah in fact i might i might just i might just is this a stupid idea james we'll find out together i might just grab this and <laughs> drop it in the discord 
Um, just so people can see, just so people can see, like, what is, this is closely related to a Patreon post you're going to get probably, probably between now and when the um, campaign ends, where uh, I want to talk about how do we, how do we make a new class starting from nothing, right? And I'm probably going to use the shadow as the example, because I prototyped the original shadow. Well, I prototyped it. I, I did the scratch pad. I did the scratch pad for the original. I call it, um, some of you will be familiar with this. I call it designlish. Like it's, it's, it's like English, but it's got a lot of design. It's got pseudo design in it, pseudo code. It's like pseudo code. If you know, if you're a programmer, right? Where it's like to an untrained eye, this might look real, but to somebody like James, he would be like, this is, this is junk. <laughs> he goes, this, no, this makes any sense. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to get the idea down in a way that looks like final design, but isn't really. Um, so this is what the operator, that's what the operator looked like. I just posted into the, um, into our discord. Um, yeah, it's great. Whoa, I just, nice. I'm getting caught up. I was, I was shelled out and I didn't. Yeah. Now, oh, oh yeah. There's a ton of stuff, ton of stuff. <laughs> I was like, am I not caught up on chat the... or is there just like a million people talking right now? Um, <laughs> is there, well, oh, this is a great question. A and Pan Carmola says, is there a likelihood of MCDM developing a digital compendium that can be searched? It's a really good question. Um, really and you question. framed it very well. Is there any likelihood? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think it is very likely, assuming the VTT happens. Now, keep in mind that um, uh, I am not yet closely involved in the VTT development. That's going to happen now that, now that we know it's real, right? Uh, so everybody cross your fingers. But the way we see it is thusly wise. The work necessary to get a VTT done the way we expect would also allow us, we think, to have an online character creator, monster editor, online compendium that you could look at, search, and use, even if you weren't in the VTT. It could just be like a web front end or an app on your phone, which would kind of, a lot of apps on your phones, they are just web front ends in a fun little package, right? So a lot of people, a lot of people heard me uh, speak effusively about the 4E online tools set and, and how much, how useful it was and how much I liked it. And then hear me talk about the VTT for this game. And they're like, oh, oh, I wanted this, not this. And I was like, oh, we, I don't think we explained this very well because I think this includes this, right? However, I also don't know the future. Um, I've tried, I bought lottery tickets in the past, but so far my oracular vision has, is not, is not incredibly finely tuned. So who knows, you know, a satellite could fall out of the sky and, crush mcdm and uh so anyway yeah 100 percent, right and, and those are the things that uh, because we know matt and i not only do we play games we run games and running games is so much easier if you have those digital tools at your disposal oh yeah which uh, yep. again for me are part and parcel with the vtt it's also having the ability to look that stuff up edit monsters build characters all that kind of stuff so um i'm very hopeful that that's going to be a, a part of this and from what i've seen it seems like it definitely should be so far so ev i think everybody's uh on thanks that. um by the way, James and I are on opposite sides of the country, so if you hear us talking over each other, that's just because, you know, it's not a full duplex kind of situation. Um, Socratic Lover Mod, thank you for catching this question from Loki Nallen. You've talked about the uh, negotiation mechanics have rules that stop it from going in circles. Uh, how will that work if NPCs initiate negotiation with the PCs? Um, PCs do not have rules for negotiated, being negotiated with. They have players. They have players that decide what their characters think. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it, it, but, but, but it, if I understand your question, um, there's nothing stopping an NPC from instant, from, from, uh, instigating a negotiation with them. Like, you know, right. the, which has happened in my game lots of times. We just didn't have rules for it, which is one of the reasons, which is one of the reasons when I would stream my game or just talk about it, people would, people would get excited. They'd be like, I didn't know you could do that in D and D it's like, yeah, well, it's cause there's no rules for it. Right. So, and, and that's a, an important part of design. Like, um, once you create rules for something, now everyone who plays the game knows it's possible. That doesn't mean they got to do it. You could easily make lots of adventures that don't have any negotiation in them and they would be still amazing, awesome adventures. But once you have rules for a thing, then everybody goes, oh, this is possible now. And they start engaging with it more. So you could definitely have, you know, the orc chieftain waves the white flag and says, hey, let's talk. 
right? That's that's an NPC starting the negotiation. They still, but but they're the one being negotiated with. Still, they're the one with the interest and patience mechanic, right? Um, it's just those, and we'll have templates for this. We'll be like, okay, so and we, I don't think you're going to need that many. I think like five templates for this would be enough. Saying what's the situation you're entering into in broad terms? Are they negotiating suing for peace? Well, then here's the starting conditions, right? That would mean their interest. Their, their interest might be middle, but their patience is really high, right? Like I am willing, I, I'm maximally willing to talk this out because I'm afraid we're all going to die if we don't, right? But also we're orcs, we have pride, we're well armored. So our interest is only in the middle here, right? Um, it might be controversial for an orc leader to try to sue for peace. The other orcs might be like, what are you doing? Right? So that's, that's our goal. That's, uh, that's how we think it'll work. Um, and let's see, question. Um, is this a beginner friendly RPG? I mean, I would say it is more beginner friendly than fifth edition. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, I think it actually is going to be pretty beginner friendly. Like by which I mean, if we get, I mean, I, I, I don't know a lot of, let me, okay. So let me take that. Let me take that question seriously. How beginner friendly a game is, I do not believe is a, um, a linear function with how complicated it is. I think there might be a relationship there between uh, how, how, how beginner friendly it is and how complicated it is. I just don't think that's one to one. I think much, much more important to the how um, beginner friendly it is is the presentation, right? I am on record as I've been saying this for years now. Presentation is part of design, right? If you have a brilliant design but you did a shit job instantiating it and explaining it to people, then then no one's going to get to appreciate it. And I, I, uh, I'm going to tell this story, even though I know, I apologize. Those of you who've been in my Twitch streams, you know this. I was working on a video game. I was the lead writer, but I had been, I had been a designer most of my life. And so I was often involved in design discussions. And it was a first-person shooter. And I was involved in this discussion because one of the things that happened when you got poisoned, for instance, by the alien wildlife, was um, your suit, your, your science fiction suit would say, toxin, toxin toxin and you'd hear this thing going off while you were taking this damage over time so you would know oh, i gotta stop and give get a stim pack oh, okay make that thing go away and one of the one of the artists on the team said this is stupid why is my suit screaming at me i hate this we should cut this dialogue the screen is already flashing red and my friend Stephen Oakley, who some of you know because he has drawn like the Olafek, he does a lot of illustrations for us. He's a legendary concept artist. He was just working. He wasn't even in this discussion. He was just working. He went, "It does," <laughs> and he was a competitive <laughs> player. He had just he had just never noticed the flashing screen. He had only ever keyed off of the audio. That's a super important point as a designer. Is you can't only explain things one way. You can't just have, for instance, if you looked at the preview, we s explain how knockback works. And it's not just here's the text, it's here's a diagram. Some people read the text and get it. Some people look at the diagram and get it. Some people need a little of both. So you kind of can't just do it one. You can't just have the flashing screen and then pat yourself on the back with what a brilliant designer you are. You need to fight these battles on multiple fronts because a game like ours is going to have, you know, something on the order of like, 20,000 people playing it, uh, you know, in the next 18 months or whatever. And, and they all have, they all come from different backgrounds. They have different perceptions. So I'm a huge bear for onboarding or making it easy to play, you know? So I'm, I'm going to be pretty heavily involved. I think I'm, this is something I have to do right now this week, probably is go over a prototype character sheet that, uh, Kyle Latino, AKA map crow has uh, mocked up for us. I haven't looked at it yet. Because I'm, I have super, I'm hyper opinionated when it comes. Look, I've worked on a lot of role playing games, including, like I said, Star Trek role playing games that are skill based role playing games. They're not about combat. In Star Trek, if somebody pulls out a phaser, somebody's about to instantly get vaporized. Um, and those skill based games tend to be a real bear for the for the character sheet because you have to. And I was always so offended at what the, at the what the graphic designer would do because it's like, are you telling me that I have to fit my astrobiology? specialization in a blank space this big on the character sheet? Did the person that designed this play this game? <laughs> right? Do they know what that blank space is for? Would get, I would get real frisky about that. So I think that's the answer to the question, how beginner-friendly is it? I think our design is very straightforward. I think it's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. I think it's evocative. I think it's fun. And as long as we onboard you well, right, then I think it would be very beginner-friendly. Um, James, you want to go? Yeah. You want to tackle mean, Matt, the question? 
Yeah, you always talk about how complicated League of Legends is, right? Uh, and yeah, it's yeah. one of the most popular yeah. games in the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's a very yep. complicated game, but because they have good onboarding and because there's people to play it with, it's... And so I think this game is going to be extremely easy to jump into if you have previous D20 fantasy experience, um, because uh, it is not a D20 fantasy game. However, you will you will look at it and be like, I get it, right? You'll, you'll get a lot of the same concepts, and you'll be like, I understand how this execution works and, and that sort of thing i think if it's your first role-playing game ever um our goal is to onboard you as easy as possible if you are totally totally new to role-playing games but it's going to be yep. um you know it's i've i've introduced a lot of new people to this game and they pick it up pretty fast um and they we have are not going to assume and I you've think already that's played the key fun yeah. Uh, Casey Love, I think I've seen you in chat before, says, when an RPG fan walks away from their first MCDM session, what do you want them to leave thinking? Well, it depends on what kind of RPG fan they are. The reason I picked this question to answer is because I do have a specific answer for this if you are a D20 player. Um, I want, I, I will feel, I, this is good. This is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. People play Dungeons & Dragons for a lot of reasons. I think a lot of people, they don't really care about the design. They just want to play the game that has bugbears and beholders in it, right? And that is totally valid. That's the reason I would go back to it because I love that tradition, right? I love the, I love the lore, right? The actual mechanics, obviously, I think are kind of junky. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making my own game. So if you are an, a, a currently experienced D20 player, I feel like we will have succeeded for you if you walk away from it going, I can't go back to the old way. I can't go yes. back to the, do I get to take my turn, right? I, I, you don't necessarily have to think our game is the best thing since sliced bread. I guarantee you everyone will find stuff in this game, including us, where we're like, eh, I wish we could have come up with something better for that, right? Because any game more complicated than like code names or Bang has things like that in it, even for developers like us, experienced developers, even the games we worked on. Every game I've ever shipped, we all sat around going, man, I wish we could have figured out a way to do this better. I wish we could have figured out a way to do this better. That same thing's going to happen. But, but there are certain things in our game where I really do feel like this is a better experience. However, that's why I said that whole thing earlier about depends on why you play D20 fan. If you're playing D&D &D because you just want to play the game that has, you know, mind flares and mimics in it, he said, comma, continuing the alliterative trend, uh, then, then knock yourself out. That's great. But if the actual game mechanics are a selling point to you or a feature or they're important, I, I think we can offer a better choice. So that's, that's yeah. Um, somebody said, this is a great question from I see dead llamas. Um, if I, I, I want to know about James, I, I, I'm more interested in James's answer to this, but I want to answer too. If you're, if I were to be a player in a long, if I were going to play this game for real in a campaign where I'm a player, a, not a play test, a long-term campaign, what would I want to build? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Here's the thing. We, uh, we don't make classes we think are dumb. Uh, yeah. right? Like every class, <laughs> yeah. every class in this game, I'm like, holy shit, I really want to play this class. That's how what we're thinking when we design the class. Like you'll see this, I think, in the shadow post. Is it's so much of our design is about um, starting with what's cool and what's fun, right? And then there, the, occasionally um, we sit there and we're talking about some mechanic and we go, ah, ah, in regards to this mechanic, the tactician could have an ability that breaks this rule. And we go, oh, yeah, that's cool, right? Uh, so, like, for instance, imagine a 10th level tactician doesn't roll damage. It's just 12, right? All y'all motherfuckers, you got to roll. You got to roll because you're not a professional like me, right? Uh, that kind of thing, we get really excited. We go, we're like, oh, that's really cool. That is an instance where the design inspires a mechanic. But usually it's the fantasy that inspires the design. Um, and so I, I, would, I would love to play, I would love to play a tactician. I would love to play a shadow. I have ideas for some characters already. I was working on an adventure for my friend Jay, Jay Hill, because um, I happen to know one of his favorite movies is a movie called Tears of the Sun. Uh, and he was, not a, he was not a tabletop nerd. He was not a role-playing nerd. But he knew I was. And he was sort of vaguely kind of curious and skeptical kind of at the same time, uh, sort of like one of the guys from Penny Arcade. And so I was working on a, 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 a scenario called, um, doesn't matter what it's called, but it was a ripoff of that movie and you were all going to play Shadows, right? Except I didn't know that. They were, I, we didn't have that class then. 
I love that idea. I'm desperate to instantiate that in our game and actually finish that adventure. So I can't, I, 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 I there, I mean, it may be the operator just cause it's so weird in, in, in this genre and to me so exciting and novel. Um, if I had to pick one right now, maybe a null, maybe a null just because I haven't, we haven't prototyped a null yet. So in my mind, it could be anything, right? Uh, James, what's your answer? Yeah, I, I mean, so for me, I live out the fantasy of being agile most uh, in, in games because I am not, right? In in real life, I am not very coordinated. I'm not very agile or Mentally anything agile. like that. So I love... <laughs> I love to be a uh, 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 shadow is really like that's my favorite sort of archetype is having lots of skills, um, being very skilled at things, being able to hide and sneak. And I love the idea that the shadow also teleports around all over the place in our game. Um, that really sells it for me. So that's the one I am looking the most forward to getting in and playing and uh, and being feeling super effective and, and the best there is at what I do, right? That, to me, that's the shadow, and that's what I want to do. <laughs> oh, may you get your wish. Uh, um, so we get a lot of questions yeah. about this, so we're going to cover it all in one answer. We get a lot of questions like, why aren't you partnering with this other company to make a VTT? I think we already answered that. Sure. I don't think any other... You, you, we see this with... The, certain VTTs specifically have... Um, built an audience for players who are who, who do not perceive themselves as players of this RPG. They perceive themselves as players of this VTT. And that's super gross to us. That creates a crazy conflict of interest. The people who make the RPG, the customer should be the players, not the peop, not a, not a third party that acts as an inter as an intermediary uh, uh, you know like a middleman trying to make money off of the devs work and be like hey what do we how do we how do we get in here so that these people see themselves as our customers not not the game's customers and that's a crazy conflict of interest to me where i don't know who wins in that scenario so for us being principally motivated to make a good product for our customers who play our game i think will result in a much better experience for everybody and and if you disagree with that, that's fine. Go make your own game. Go make your own RPG. This is I, I, I have I have I have the best I can the best so okay the best I can do is explain our thinking. But you may notice you watching this right now that there are some people in chat, some people online who they don't really want an answer. They want us to do it their way. They don't really care why are we doing it. They just want us not to do it the way we want to do it and to do it their way. Well. That's what I mean when I'm like, if, 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 if you don't agree with me, that's fine. We don't have to agree. But, but at the end of the day, it, it's our responsibility to do our best for our customers, right? That's why I've been, I've been banging on the idea of us doing our own VTT since 2018. And then people are asking, are we looking for help? We got a lot of um, people emailing hello at MCDM Production saying, I am a developer. I'm a professional app developer. I want to help with this. Um, well, the reason we were able to talk about the stretch goal of VTT in the crowdfunder is because we already have a partner. We don't need help. Mm -hmm. Now, again, who knows what the future holds? You know, um, it, it may be that, it, that this crashes and burns and, and we got to go back to the drawing board. But uh, that hasn't happened yet. And so there's no plan to do that. So no, we're not looking for help. And uh, we, believe in, we believe in our vision that our, the best thing for us or our customers and our players is a VTT, an online suite of tools, character builder, monster editor, that'd be great. Um, yeah, that stuff's super, it's super important to us, but only because I've had the experience of how powerful a VTT can be, but I had to bust my ass to make it work. And that sucked, right? So if it just worked, if it just worked and it was, it just made everything faster and more fun and easier to use, then, then we're doing well. Yeah. And it's also to say that like, we are going to have, uh, you know, an, an open game system that if somebody wants to, uh, you know, put the rules that are open onto their VTT and make that work that way, they will be able to do that with our, our open license. Um, so we are not going to stop people, right? It's it's not an exclusive partnership. We're not going to stop people from doing that. Um, but no. I, I am in full agreement with you, Matt. Like, I think if, if our virtual tabletop is first party, we're going to be able to deliver the best experience for folks. And that means all kinds of possibilities that we're constantly, there's like every day, I feel like there's a revelation where I'm talking to you or the general manager or somebody else. And it's like, oh, 
we could do this because we are doing this, right? Or we could do that because we're doing this. And that to me feels really powerful and awesome. And I, I'm excited to give that to people. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to do, it's going to, it's going to give us a lot of power in design and testing to iterate on things a lot faster because James, James can just go into a Lua script and update, update the design. And then all of a sudden, when we internally jump into the VTT to test the game, everything's, everything's different. And we, we, the players didn't have to do anything, right? James already did it in the back end. And now that, that that's going to be a big, huge tool for us in terms of iteration. How fast can we iterate on the design? Because I can't tell you how many play tests we've done where the design changed and James had to explain it like five times, right? Because, because like we're all smart people and we're all paying attention, but it's a complicated game and our characters are complicated. And, you know, I'm sitting there reading what my ability does while James is telling Lars how this other thing has changed. And then later on, I get to that thing. I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Uh, and James has to explain it again. But if it's like it's all done, it's like, oh, look at that. It's, it just automatically updates. So that's, that's really powerful. Um, let me see. There was another question. I, I'm sorry. I think that was one question from me. Um, James, you got any questions you want to answer? Yeah. So there's a question about one of my favorite parts of D20 uh, fantasy is uh, outside of combat spells like charm person, locate object, etc. Will there be something like this in the MCDM RPG? Yes, we will definitely have utility things that you can use. Um, some of them will exist as class uh, powers, right, that you have access to. Some of them will exist as parts of your other character building options, right? Um, maybe your past is going to grant you some cool ability that you can use out of combat. It might be that your uh, titles have cool stuff that you can do. Um, we also, I saw a question upstream about rituals, right? And so this idea yeah. of like, do you have rituals in the game? Matt and I had a great conversation about it we don't what we have is a crafting system where you can build a magic item and that magic item might be expendable and allow you to do something like teleport halfway through the world raise somebody yeah. from the dead uh send a super long distance communication right summon a, open a gate to hell whatever um and so we think because people are already going to engage with the crafting system we don't need another system for rituals we just yeah. need the crafting system and the crafting system allows you to make items that give you the effect of a ritual and so um there are all going to be all kinds of things that will benefit you out of combat there already are I, you know the talent at first level has a telekinesis ability where they can lift people in objects and and fly them around yeah. very useful in combat very useful outside of combat as well yeah yeah there's a lot that was a big breakthrough for us when we realized hang on a minute do we need rituals can't we just can't we just leverage this uh, existing but I mean existing but unprototyped <laughs> idea for a system uh, research and crafting yeah. and as soon as we hit upon that idea we're like this is better this is better this is easier um, it's, it's great it's will great. something so Kevin Rollins <laughs> asks I'm glad this is a great question I'm glad somebody asked it um, will something like feats be present in the game uh, yeah and I want to get I want to uh, uh, people already people already uh, some people already know this but I wanted to use this opportunity to kind of dive into it a little bit and James, James can correct me yeah. if I say anything that does not match his expectation we don't have feats. We have something called titles, right? And titles um, is, we, is something I think we've had in, um, the, the, I think they're in Kingdoms and Warfare. Aren't there titles in, um, I'm trying to think. I think there's, like, like if you look at the chain of actors. There are. Yeah, right, there was each a point organization where I came up with titles. titles. Yeah, each, yeah, right, right, that's right. Each organization has titles. Those are going to, so that, that already, that design already exists. It's already in 5e. It's in, um, it's in Kingdoms and Warfare. But we're going to just instantiate it differently in this game. It's not going to be part of your organization. It's going to be part of your character. And titles allow us to do things like when my friend Silvano's uh, dragonborn uh, paladin prayed to St. Isolde in a desperate moment, and he rolled really well on his... When he made his concordance roll, he rolled really well. He rolled so well, I gave him a title that powered up his dragon breath, right? He was the... He was uh, Now he was a... Um, he was the knight exorcist. So he got a little card that said he is the knight exorcist. And it says, you know, it, the narrative is you're the chosen of St. Isolde. You did this thing. Uh, in this case, he prayed and got a really good result or whatever in a desperate moment. And she listened and heard and saw. And so now, you know, once per whatever, your dragon breath gets buffed severely and you like it. Okay. That's an example of how titles work. You want to, you, you've, you've met, um, you met Flight Captain Myriad of the Hawk Lords and you saw his giant osprey that he rides. You're like, oh, that guy, look at him. He's resplendent in his, in his armor and he's got this dope. I want one of those guys. Well, okay. If it'll say under the, um, under the Hawk Lord title, here's how you become a Hawk Lord. 
You got to do A, B, and C, and then you get this title and you get a big hawk. But, but I think there's also going to be just sort of like tier one titles that you can just pick, right? That you can just pick that are more like feats and aren't, that aren't as cool, right? But still have a lot of functionality and give you more opportunities to customize your characters, I think, right? And uh, it might be that some of those you have to qualify for. Right, there might be, you know, you have to have a, you have to, your might has to be three or higher or whatever, or some titles you might, you have to, they're a tactician title, right? Any tactician can take this, but only tacticians can take it. Um, that's that's how I imagine this design working. So, James, is that in accord with your expectation, or would you prefer? Do you think? Do you think? Uh, yeah, ha- yeah. Okay, fair enough. Look, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. <laughs> so, so when you think feats. Um, just say titles, right? Except that our titles are a little, they're going to be a little different than feats, right? I, they're they're going to be in some, some things that are existing feats in 5e, we will probably have titles like that, but we're going to have a lot of titles that you've got to do something to get. And those can have much cooler earn. rewards and like narrative benefits. Yeah, there's a, I, I've seen some different questions about like mounts and vehicular combat and things like that. Um, huh. That is something that will probably not be in the core rules, um, but we, we will talk about it. If the Beast Heart ends up in the core rules, we'll have rules for companions, and many companions make good mounts. Um, so it may be that we have something like that, but a vehicular combat may be something that you actually see in if we if we end up making a future timescape line of products you might see yeah. vehicular combat in one of those books because there's a lot of sailing in the sea of stars um and that would be pretty cool to have yeah those and, uh, and getting around in the timescape can be like being on a on a on a sailing ship being attacked by pirates or it could be like being on an interstellar dreadnought depending on how high up in the timescape you are and so that kind of when we were when we were imagining a product line and we were trying to figure out what would be like what would be the unique the unique rule set that you go to the timescape book or box set in order to get? We thought vehicle combat. We have no idea how vehicle combat would work. None. Um, I designed a starship combat system for, um, I, I guess technically two of them, uh, one for a Star Trek, the second Star Trek role-playing game I worked on. It was relatively popular, um, but that was a capital ship combat, right? So that's one of the things is like, Sailing ships work differently than starships. Capital ships work differently than X-Wings and TIE Fighters. So we have no idea how that's going to work. So that's, that's very far off. But mounts, I don't, think, I don't think vehicle combat is core to this fantasy. You know, this isn't Mad Max. This isn't the Mad Max RPG. Um, if it was, you know, maybe Dead World under Black Star. If it was, then absolutely. But no, I don't think vehicle combat. That's another part of the kind of like, don't, don't try to do everything and half-ass everything and... And all that does is it makes directors have to do more work to polish these unfinished systems. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How many times have you seen, I've used XYZ system in D&D, but I did this. And it's like, oh, you actually wrote a whole new system is what you did. You just yeah, left the D20 yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. Which, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a good us. exercise. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that, oh, I'm yeah, glad, you know, great. I often recommend... Um, uh, against the cult of the reptile god is a great starting adventure, but the reason I recommend it is because of how kind of janky it is and how much work it is for the, a director to finish, right? It's like why why are our characters doing any of these things? No answer, right? You know, so having to like connect the dots of the plot and make it feel like a modern adventure that makes sense takes work, and it's useful for new GMs to have to do some work. Like the adventure does a lot of work, but it doesn't do all of it, and you got to close that gap. And so that's why it's not because I think it's a um, a, po- a finished polished adventure. Uh-uh. Um, anyway. Mm-hmm. Do I have any plans for more stretch goals? Uh, no. No, 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 no. We don't, um, we don't yeah. run crowdfunders. <laughs> you don't want us to. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't want us to, you don't want us to add more stretch goals. Um, the, 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 we don't run crowdfunders like a game show the way I, I know a lot of other um, companies do where they obscure their real their real need, right? Like we came out of the gate with, we're, it's going to take $800,000 to do this. And I saw lots of people online who were like, you know, that's insane. You got to start, you got to start with an unrealistically low number so that you fund instantly. 
Uh, but it's like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. I've seen so many uh, crowdfunders do this where I look at it and I'm like, there's no way they could make that product for that much money. It is impossible. I, I'm a game developer. I'm telling you, you can't do it. So, and they're not dumb, but they set that low on purpose to game the system. We don't do that. Right. Um, I've watched, I've watched people that I, I know in real life who are, you know, uh, well-respected uh, developers launch a crowdfunder for a line of RPG products where I look at it and I'm like, my God, I think there's like 20, you're, you're crowdfunding like 20 books. The, the, the economics of crowdfunding doesn't work that way. Like they add all these crazy stretch goals to kind of game the system. And it's like, we don't, no, 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 that's not us. That's not us. We're not, there's no behind the scenes nonsense that we hide from people because we're trying to, cook the books or any of that stuff. If we say this is what we're doing, it's what we're doing. If we say, so more stretch goals would um, obligate us to do, obligate us to do stuff that isn't finish the game and get it to you. Why do you want that? What, what's, what's the, right? Like whatever you're imagining a stretch goal is, we, we, we want to do that too. Uh, yeah, yes, we would love to do a capital box set. Yes, we would love to do a timescape box set. We would love to do tons of adventures, but all of those things need to live or die on their own merits. The, the, the money from this, if you start spending it on distant future projects, then you end up making things that people don't buy. People didn't want. You spent a lot of money on this. We spent a lot of money on this. We didn't go to crowdfunding for it. Nobody bought it. That was a mistake, right? That's one of the really powerful things about crowdfunding that people overlook is that um, as, a development, as a development tool, it is super useful because it's like, oh shit, now we know how many people want this. Right. And that is a very, that's very useful when it comes to trying to figure out like how, how much time should we spend on this? Well, a lot, because a lot of people want this anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge, uh, important thing for us because what this is going to allow us to do now is focus on the game, pour it all into the game and make the game as big and b as great as we can. Right. Um, and it won't delay the progress of the game, uh, which is really important to yeah. us. We, we want to get it out there as much as you all want to have it. Right. We just, but we want to take our time and we want to make it good. Um, and, uh, and the, the money we get from the Kickstarter will help with that. And it also like, exponentially increases right the the production cost the more books you make so um that's, yep. that's a big part of it too <laughs> yep, 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 yep. james do you want to handle the overland quest the overland travel question yeah sure so uh, lots of questions about overland travel so again we want to do the things this game does we want to do very well and we don't want to do that at the expense or page count of doing some other things right um and so will there be rules for how far you can travel in a day probably right like it'll say like oh yeah if you're traveling on foot you could make it from here to here if you're traveling on a horse you could do this right like we, we may have rules like that so that you know how long is it going to take how many days will it take for me to get from uh you know uh gravesford to Bedegar City, right? Uh, but the thing that we were probably not going to have then are rules for like, here's the point at which you get exhausted. Here's how much food and water you need to consume each day. Um, here is how, uh, like, if you don't rest for this long, it's going to make it, you travel half as far the next day, right? Like, those are the kinds of rules that this game isn't about because it's an explicitly heroic game, right? And we don't think that that contributes to the heroic experience. Now, Matt and I both love games like that, right? Like we both love games where there are rules for that kind of travel and, and planning out your like, oh, we better plan the best route and that kind of thing. I think that that's awesome, but I don't think it has a place in this game. Now, you might see that in an adventure. If that becomes an important part of an adventure we put out, we're not going to leave you hanging and, and let you do it yourself. We will give you rules for that if that becomes important, but that's probably not core more than... More than, hey, you can probably move this much in a day is not core. And I don't even know if that's core yet because we haven't written those rules. Uh, yeah, I, it, it's all about, it's all like the, the extended test rules. We, we are, I, I already did a video on this, I think, about overland travel. Mm -hmm. And it kind of shows you the, how the community splits over some of this stuff, which we see just in these live streams and videos where it's like you should only be, you should only be doing, and I told a, a really long story about overland travel on a game I worked on. Uh, go watch, go watch that video. I talk about like, look, this, it, it, unless your game is about how dangerous the wilderness is, like that's the point of the game. That's an exploration game. That's a hex crawl game. The point of the game is how dangerous the wilderness is. Unless that's your game, then getting from point A to point B should not be a big deal unless in this adventure, that's part of the thing. 
right? In this moment in the adventure, just getting to the dungeon or whatever is a big deal. And that's what the extended tests are for. And you're going to do it. You're going to get there, right? The only question is how much, how, how much nasty stuff happens on the way there? Are there bad guys waiting for you? Did your, did your, did the, did the enemy party get there before you? That kind of stuff. It's not about, um, it's not about surviving in the wilderness, all right. Even even the original game wasn't about surviving in the wilderness. The original game in 1974 told you you had to go buy another company's product called um, Outdoor Survival by Avalon Hill uh, in order to figure out if you survived the trip from the dungeon back to town. Yep. Yeah, 100%. And that's one of those things where uh, like, we, we do a lot of like, it's really tricky. You'll see people in this chat. I mean, you'll see we, we've already, the moderators are doing their best to whack them all these people where somebody, somebody will ask a question and it's not easy for us to tell the difference between I actually, I actually want to know the answer and I don't care what the answer is. I, I don't like that you are doing this. And I'm, ask, I'm, I'm phrasing it as a question in order to try to... And so it, it's not easy for us to tell the difference between those people. That's why we sometimes... I, I, James doesn't do this. James is much nicer than I am. Um, I sometimes get short with people because it's like that person is not really an, asking a question. They're telling us that they don't like what we're doing. It's like, well, okay, cool. Knock yourself out. But that, the problem is some people, it's not enough that they don't like what we're doing. They don't think you should like it. And that's where we start blocking and banning people, right? Because you, you don't get to tell the people that do like our design that they, that in our, in our, in our community here in this chat, you can do say it anywhere else you want. That's fine. But in our community, in our discord, in our chats, if, if that's your attitude, we're just going to, we're just going to ask you to leave, except we won't ask. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There are some uh, good questions about, do the abilities that kits give cost you a resource? Uh, no, they, they essentially, you can use them once per encounter. Um, so that's a little like extra boom, once per encounter thing that, uh, that you can use. Um, so, and who knows, right? We're talking about abilities that you might get from your past, and uh, we're looking at how those might work too, right? So um, it, yeah, yeah, it might yeah. be that abilities from your past you can use, I don't know, once per scene or something like that if they're out of combat. Uh, or it might just be you can use them whenever, but they're only going to be situationally useful. Or it could be a whole bevy of things, right? Like a kit could give you an ability that is useful more than once per counter encounter if we decide that that's right for that kit right um so we don't feel like uh, uh matt was uh, said this yesterday to me when we were having a design meeting like what we don't want to do is establish like this is the way this works and then say we're never allowed to break those rules um if yeah. we're like hey it, it would work for this right so maybe martial kits work one way but caster kits work another maybe you know that that's the kind of thing that we're we're looking at and talking about all the time it's really fun it's really really fun to have those handcuffs taken off, honestly. It's great. Yeah. It's freeing. And yeah. I put them on um, myself all the time and Matt takes them off. It's great. Yeah. There's a, that, yeah, it's, 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 it's tricky. Once you, once you solve a problem, you, uh, and this is true of anybody, any designer does this, you tend to want to use that solution okay. everywhere. But it's like, hang on a minute. Sometimes, sometimes bespoke problems need bespoke solutions. Um, there's a couple of questions I want to make sure we cover. Somebody asked about how will the Vasloria box set work as a product? Will we, uh, will we, meaning the backers, automatically get it? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. That's, that's the reason we made it a stretch, a stretch goal, and we said the stretch goal isn't, the stretch goal isn't the box set. The stretch goal is not the box set. The stretch goal is <laughs> we're going to hire somebody and, and cross your fingers if that goes well. At some point in the probably distant future, a box set will exist that you're going to have to buy. Right now, what we normally do, and I think I mentioned this in the video, or I should say what we did with Where Evil Lives, it worked pretty well, was we do what we call a printing, which is like it's a crowdfunding campaign where we're saying, okay, how many people, how many people want this product in print versus how many people want it in PDF? Because we don't know right now. Like, no one knows right now. Uh, and that's how we know how many to print because if we print 10,000 and only 2,000 people want it, we just screwed ourselves, right? And, and when that happens with Where Evil Lives, it's usually like two or three months later, you're going to get the product. Like I ordered where evil lives just like a normal person. Uh, I just backed it because I just want to see how the process with backer kit worked. So I just made an, a backer kit account. I ordered where evil lives and it just showed up like three days ago. And I was like, Hey, look at that. The system works. We thought people would start getting like the system didn't know that I was the owner of the company. It just sent it to me like a normal random person. And I got it before the end of the year during the crowdfunder, which is about how we thought it was going to work. 
So that's probably what will happen. Um, I also want to make sure we cover the idea of the license. Um, we're still talking mm, about yes. that. Our, our, the, 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 the real problem is not everybody at the company is equally well-educated on the notion of an OGL in the first place because not everybody at this company is from tabletop or indeed from specifically like role-playing, right? Like Jason's an inveterate tabletop player, but Warhammer doesn't have an open license, right? So the, it, the, the process of educating everybody at the company about what this is and how to make it useful. So there, it, it's easy to look at like the Shadow Dark license, which we have looked at and go like, oh, maybe that would work. And then, and then I, I, I raise my hand and I go, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's what we want. Like, you know, it, we want people to, we want people to be able to take our monsters and use them. That means there needs to, there probably needs to be something like a system reference document where here's all the monsters from the monster book. There you go. Right. You know, if you want to use them in your products, knock yourself out. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem for us. I think financially people are still going to come to, for one thing, there's still many people are still going to want to buy the actual monster book because the actual monster book is going to have stuff like all the lore and it'll have all the rules and advice for doing stuff. Um, plus a lot of people like stuff in print, but that's the, that's the process is we want, we actually want people to make and create. It's not a gimmick. Um, it's, we want, we want people to be able to make and create stuff for this game. And that means they're going to need to be able to use our rules and some of our content. What we don't want people to be able to do, and this is where it gets really thorny and tricky, we don't want people to be able to reprint our books, right? We don't want it to be like, oh, we opened the game, and now somebody somebody could just literally copy copy all of our products and just upload them, you know, and and distribute them, or or literally go to a printer and print them. So that's tricky. And as soon as I most most of you are just listening to this, going, oh, okay, that makes sense. I'm sure they'll figure it out. But some people in chat will hear this answer as an invitation to say, well, then you should use this license or you should use this license. And the problem with that is many of those people, now we're talking about a fraction of a fraction, many of those people, they, they don't, they, they, it's more important to them that we use this one license than it is that we make a game or that we have our own license. or right, That's the thing that motivates them is they, want, they don't want to play our game or they don't want to buy it. They want to give us applause for doing what they think of as the right thing. Well, we're going to do what we think is the right thing. And that might mean using this one existing license or that other license, but not because we see these licenses as some kind of moral virtue. No, because it does what we want. Because we sat and thought about what do we want? What do we want the license to do? What do we want to make sure the license doesn't do? And then we went and looked. Is there a license that does that? It's a process, right? And it's a process that we have already started. We have already an email thread with our lawyer who's really good with this stuff and also a gamer. This is somebody who, when I met him, had already played through all of Gloomhaven a couple of times and was running Curse of Strahd. Uh, so this is somebody who understands this ecology and, and we'll get there. Uh, so you'll see people saying, why aren't they using this license? Those people are differently motivated than we are. And I suspect differently motivated than most of our audience. Most of the audience just wants to know that they could make an adventure that has our monsters in it, right? And use those stat blocks and not get in trouble. That's all they want. That's what we want to. Hopefully that's a, hopefully I'm going to look at chat now. Hopefully that's a good answer. And hopefully people are like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think I, mm -hmm. I, I've been watching the chat and I think a lot of people are excited for the license and there are people who, you know, we want people to create stuff with this system, right? That's a big part of this system for us is we want you to be able to um, make cool stuff. And we would like to not just support that in a license, but find ways to support people who, who, make stuff with our system. And if we like that stuff, we'd like to find a good way to support that. So we're talking about all kinds of ways that that is definitely uh, uh, going to happen. And, and we're going to be working on, you know, that we're, I promise you, we're looking at all different kinds of license. We're having constantly talking about it. It's a big thing that is important to everybody at the company. We just need to make sure that we're doing it in a way that works for us and works for the people here um, because we want it to work for and serve all of you as well. So, we, you know, uh, much like we want our products to be the best they can be so that you can use them at the table because we want you to actually play with them at the table. We want you to actually use the license to make stuff. Um, and so that is a big, big part of what's on board. Uh, and I think everybody needs to go look at the cat because the cat is awesome. <laughs> Max. Nobody. That's why, that's why I turned around. I'm like, nobody wants to see me. They want to see Max. Ow! Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Anyway, hi. How are you folks doing? Uh, um, one o'clock. We got about another 20 minutes. 
Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So let me see if there's uh, anything I've else. Our mods, by the way, are doing. Questions. I want to oh, shout out the mod team uh, because moderating YouTube chat is way, way worse than moderating Twitch. Twitch has much better moderation tools than YouTube does. YouTube has gotten better, but it's not good. So when people are like, how come you're on Twitch? It's like, look, because as there, people are people are wankers and and you need the ban hammer and uh yeah hello hello max oh maxine maxine ben Vereen, shrink to the size of a lima bean um <laughs> hello tiny yeah. girl tiny girl she's cat. so cute she's the cutest cat ever oh my god um can <laughs> i turn into animals in the ncdm rpg uh, no but your character can um yes Sorry, that was me being uh, well. glib in what I hope was a uh, taken in a friendly In way. your imagination. Um, we talked about that actually in the last uh, live stream. Um, uh, can you uh, share, uh, Zoe? Yeah, we answered that question about ancestries and the relationship between um, ancestries. And somebody asked a question about how many ancestries there'll be in the book. We don't know. Um, you're probably yep, going to get know. a preview of two more ancestries in the next week or two. Um, mm-hmm. So you'll get a sense of what direction we're going. I have no idea how many ancestries will be in the core rules for the same reason. I don't know how many classes will be in the core rules. Um, however, I suspect a, a bunch because I think like James, how, how, how strongly do you believe right now? And it's okay if the answer is not strongly at all. How strongly do you believe right now that a ancestry will be a two page spread? Oh, uh, pretty strongly. I think, okay. um, in in okay. terms of, I really like that that setup and the way it looks. So I I, but I, you know, I also am not, I'm not ready to fight for that either, <laughs> uh, because oh, we yeah, may yeah, need more enough. space, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, there's um, a lot we may of need lore. More space, there's we may a want lot of lore, space, right? So yeah, it all depends. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. every it's um it's it's like Tetris. Like you can't it, 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 it's you're playing you're playing Tetris with the layout and um, you know. Yeah, w- one reason some, some I people feel would that not mind if because... we cut all the lore, and then other people other sure. people would be like, no, 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 the lore is the part I like. So we'll see. Yeah, I really, I um, really, uh, really like reading the lore. I think it makes it fun, and I also think that the art is a really important piece of this. Right, that our our ancestries, even the ones you know by their name from other games or other media, they have their own look in the MCDM RPG, right? Dwarves are made of stone. Elves have these cool ears and this kind of alien look. Um, And I think presenting some really cool big art is important for people uh, in the game as well. And so that takes up a significant chunk of the page as well. It does. You guys want to hear what I was working on yesterday? I'm going to share with you a little preview here. I can do this because I'm the boss and no one can stop me. And this is what we mean about open development. Um, So this is something that we're going to marry with some art. This text, this text is not going to survive. Actually, actually, I'm not going to do this because it's disrespectful to James. Um, uh, I'll probably, I'll probably read it on st- on my on my stream tonight. James has better things to do, especially considering he's already read this. So I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, there are some good questions about um, like advancement and and can you improve your stats and can you the the answer is yes everything you would expect to go up is going to go up as you level up in this game um, we've talked a little bit about how advancements works it's also in the preview right now the idea is you earn victories victories turn into XP when you rest XP accumulate enough of it you level up boom um, and so there's there are things that are going to advance in ways that you may not think they would right the way a kid advances is you find better items and that uh, those items uh, are link in with your kit right if a kit says hey i can use a heavy weapon and i find a great axe that means that uh, great when i use the great any kit that allows me to use a heavy weapon i can use this great axe which is going to boost my damage and it's also going to do all these other cool magic things right um so that's how we envision kit improvements right now is like you find better equipment not necessarily your kit improves just through you leveling up but we have advice about like here's how you should dole out magic items and how often people should be getting them and, and that sort of thing for directors and There's you can also make them. from uh... that's great news He's from uh, Venetius uh, Makado. I don't know how to pronounce that name. I apologize. I did my best. Will the rat people from Thief be core or in the Vasloria box set? Um, I don't know, man. I would love 
or Raiden, Raiden Whites, which is literally just like Anglo-Saxon for uh, mm-hmm. rat person. I would love Raiden Whites to be core. Um, I think they're a really popular fantasy. Um, I love them. Uh, I was a, um, a Rattling player in, uh, I, had a, I had a fun Rattling deck in L5R. But, um, but the, the answer to this, as with it, basically everything else, is we don't know. Um, uh, we did get another, some cool another question. Raiden Whites uh, made for flea mortals that just didn't end up in the book due to space. Um, but they were great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, hopefully you'll see some uh, at some point. Yeah, there was in, a lot of stuff um, like the Apocalypse Knights, right? If there's a Death Knight, then surely there's a War Knight, a Famine Knight, and a Plague Knight um, yeah. that we actually developed uh, and we had to cut. Um, so you'll probably get those in uh, in in Monsters. Um um, da, 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 no, 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 no. somebody asked, uh, how, uh, how involved are other people with the lore? Um, as James describes me, I'm, I'm the lore master, right? It's my, it's my, ultimately it's my setting, but the reality is it's not, it, it used to be my setting. Now it's MCDM's setting. So for instance, like I never imagined dwarves looking the way Jason drew them. Right. But I don't know what I imagined. Actually, I, I, I could describe them. Right. I could describe how their flesh is supple like our flesh, but it's also hard like rock. It's magic. Right. It's a silico organic hybrid. Right. And so that's where swords spark off. They were hairless. Right. But they still looked dwarfy, you know, and that was it. That's all I had. I couldn't see them clearly in my mind. Um, that's part of the, I'm not an artist. I'm not an illustrator. That's my, I, I, um, I think cinematically, but not necessarily visually in that respect. And so Jason was burdened with the awful job of trying to figure out what does that mean, right? And then and then try to instantiate it in a way that he was inspired by. And the first thing he drew, which you can see some of in the, it's the kind of the Shiara Skuro effect uh, in the lower right of the dwarf page, I think. Um, you can see some of that original design and I was like, oh my God, it was so cool. Like his original design for the MCDM dwarf was just off the chart, crazy cool. And I fell in love with it. I was like, this is really fucking cool. But the next morning when I woke up, I'm like, it's too weird. I think it's too weird. And Jason's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't, you can't tell me how awesome it is. And then the next day say, but change it. And I'm like, I get it, but give, let me make a case. Right. It's the worst thing you can do to an artist is say, I love it. Change it. Right. It's like, well, right. <laughs> Pick. Um, but I had to explain to him, I said, I think these are the steel dwarves, right? These guys are too alien. They're too, those are the space dwarves. I need to see something kind of a little halfway between this thing and a kind of a classic dwarf. And I just explained it to him, and he was like, well, we'll see, right? And I told him, I said, look, man, it, you're the art director. It's up to you. At the end of the day, they're going to look like whatever you think they should look like. All I'm going to do is give you my feedback, and you can do what you want with it. And, uh, that's, you know, that's how it works is he's in charge. What am I going to, what am I going to do? Fire him? <laughs> don't, be, don't be ridiculous. I'm gonna draw it myself. Get out of here. Right? So it's like, no, no, no. Jason's the art director. It's his job to d- develop, to develop the, or, like we thought there was going to be all sorts of cool art for the crowdfunder. But one of the things that we decided we wanted to do before we went, uh, before December 7th was have the, have some original visual design. And that takes a long time, like inventing new visual design, like for the dwarfs, it takes months. It takes months of back and forth sketches, iteration. Uh, it's not just, you have an idea and you draw it. Uh -uh. And so that came at the cost of other stuff. Didn't seem to harm people's uh, engagement or enthusiasm. So that was the right call. But yeah, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm in charge technically, but everybody who works on this has something they, they're, that's their, that's their kind of, um, domain where it's like, well, you're in charge of this. So yeah, now that's how it works in my world and we'll all find out together, you know, and every, all the, all the freelancers that write with us, some stuff they invent lore wise passes, passes through the mat membrane. Some things bounce off the mat membrane, but I often like, um, like Willie's, uh, Willie had a really cool an elaborate write-up for this mercenary company and how you hire them. And there's a bar and there's all these drinks you order. And I was like, that's super cool, but we've got a word count here and I, there's other stuff we want to say. So I'm just going to, I work really hard. I try really hard not to throw out what a freelancer invents. Right. But, but at the end of the day, they don't know our world as well as we do. So I sit there trying to go, okay, how do I rewrite? I don't want to throw it out and write my own thing. Right. What I want to do is I want to take what they wrote and, interpret it in our world ideally so that when they read it they go oh i get it i see what i see what i wrote is in there but this is the mcdm version of it 
And the and our belief is the more we do this, and this is the kind of thing that's going to take years, but it'll happen. The more we do it, the more our partners will be able to just write it, and it passes. It took me five years of working with Paramount to, before I submitted a product to them that came back approved, no changes. Uh oh, no, 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 no. If, for instance, all of a sudden my screen goes black, that's because Max stepped on the power. Max does this about once a day. Max turns off the internet. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Max breaks the internet. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge thing. And I think being able to work with partners is, is really exciting and being able to give them stuff about the world. It's so, uh, I feel like, you know, we're constantly, I think even today, right? I sent you a message and I was like, hey, is there a yada yada? And you were like, yeah. there's not, but here's how I would form that, right? And that was really helpful yeah. for me because I was like, okay, well, if I am going to make up a place, it would probably do this and this. And now when I do that, I can come back to you and say like this, right? And like, that's how that's how we learn, yeah. right? The same way I am learning directly yeah. from you about your world. Um, everybody else yeah. can do that, right? That we work with, which is great. There are processes for these things. It's just that... Um, they're all they're all different. Like so, for instance, uh, he was asking me about how to name a city. In what, is there a name? Or do I have a list of names of cities in Kamara? Kamara is our uh, high fantasy ancient Egypt analog. And I was like, nope, <laughs> nope, because no one's ever been there in my setting. People have been from there in my play, players have been from there. I think Gertz's character was one of the Sand Scorpions. He was a, a slave of Ajax, but he fought in the Pharaoh's army. Um, so there, there, there might be one or two around here somewhere, but I'm like, here's what I would do. I would go find a map, an, a map of ancient Egypt, the more detailed and obscure, the better. And I would find some likely looking name and I would just go and tweak it a little bit, right? That's a process because I personally, and you, you might feel very differently about this. You, the chatter watching this or the video on demand person watching this. I personally feel like just making random syllables up whole cloth. That's fine for science fiction. Like, you know, uh, like Star Wars has characters named like Glop Schlombach. And you're like, that's not, <laughs> no, I, that's not how language works, man. But it's fine for science fiction because science fiction, I think, can get away with that stuff. But fantasy tends to be more grounded in realities that we, that we are familiar with, right? Like a, lo a lot of fantasy it takes place in a place that is notionally known as fantasy land. Right, where as soon as you say it's a fantasy novel, the reader goes, oh, so there's probably a tavern somewhere with a blacksmith and people get around on horses. Where if you say it's a science fiction novel, they don't know anything. It could be, how do you get around in a science fiction novel? I don't know. I don't know. Is it The Matrix? Is it Mad Max? Is it Star Wars? Right, that's all science fiction. So for me, that process of go find something kind of analogous in the real world, do some original research. Well, maybe not original research. Don't go be an archaeologist. That's ridiculous. But go do some legitimate research into this place. Find something that inspires you and then go whoop, and tweak it a little bit. So at one point, I, and we have, we have people, we're only, getting, we're only getting started on this and it's going to take us a while to build this up. But uh, there was, I was writing for something for the preview packet. Uh, not the packet, not the, 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 pe the preview on the Kickstarter page, the crowdfunder. Uh, let me start again. I was working on something that we thought was going to be in one of the previews in the uh, backer kit campaign, but it got cut. And while I was working on it, I said to James, James, do we have someone in our pocket, in our network, who is a uh, accessibility or an accessibility? What's the word I'm looking for? James, sensitivity? Cultural? Sen like a sensitivity reader who knows or is familiar with the Nahuatl language, the language of the... Uh, I think even contemporaneous Mayans and stuff like that, because I want to name a city of Ix and the, and whatever, whatever the word is, it should be, it should translate to uh, the place where the sun touched the ground. And that's the name of their capital city in Nahuatl. And what I want is I want a couple of options because I don't speak that language. I'm not from that part of the world. I'm not an expert in those things. We know people who are, we like working with those people. However, those people tend not to be, uh, you know, fantasy authors. <laughs> and so they, if you just, you, I'm like, give me a selection of authentic things that I can pick the cool one, right? Because at the end of the day, if it's, we, we also want it, we don't just like it, the idea that it's uh, actually referencing real stuff. Cause I love the, one of the best things about reading fiction, especially when you're a kid uh, is you're reading some like, you know, Terry Pratchett novel and he's talking about how Ankh Morport works. And you're like, this is fucking crazy. This is amazing. And then years later you're reading the ghost map and you're like, Oh my God, 
All of this stuff Pratchett wrote that I thought was fantasy is real. This really happened. Connecting those dots as a reader, as a person, as a human being, I think is fascinating and it helps us, it helps us, it helps stimulate our interest in how the past worked and how other cultures work. And I think that stuff's awesome. But at the end of the day, I'm the lore master. It's still got to be cool. So that's, that's the process. Complicated. Hundred percent. There's a, a a question. A lot of people have been asking about the GM screen. They they didn't get the Ajax edition, but they just want the the screen, the director's screen that comes with that. Um, I, we believe in the power of a director's screen. That is something that we're talking about. How would we develop a different one? Um, because the one that is in that box set is exclusive to that box set. But uh, we're talking right now. It's not something that would be part of the crowdfunder, but it is something that we would maybe see in our store. We got lots of time to develop something like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we are thinking about that. We know that is a thing that people want. It is totally on our radar. Um, and it's something that we want, right? It's something we don't want to gate that behind uh, Ajax, but we want the one that is in Ajax to be special for the people who got those editions. Uh, let's see there. I saw some questions here about, um, uh, death and dying. Uh, so specifically the question was, uh, if we have ways to come back from the dead, um, what are the ways that we can still tell dramatic stories? What are the stakes? And I think that is a good question. Um, and it's a question for a lot of games because a lot of games have mechanics where you can come back from the dead. Um, and the idea is that like, if you fail, you can still fail without dying, right? Or you could die, and while you're dead, failure happens because you you failed to stop the thing. Um, evil wins, right? Like tyrants take over, or uh, you know the the uh, your rival it now runs the city when you come back to life. I think that kind of stuff is actually really cool to have. Hey, like, hey, you were dead, and we brought you back. But it's been a hundred years, and because you failed, here's how the world has changed now, right? That kind of thing is is great. Um, so there's definitely the possibility to come back to life, right, is part of the fun. And it also means that the people you are fighting can come back from the dead, right? Um, so, like, you know, you, you want to be sure yeah. that uh, th there are lots of stakes beyond death um, in this game, and we will make that very clear. Uh, Pedro says, as a history buff, it never ceases to amaze me how real life history is often more unbelievable than most fantasy. Um, yeah, my friend Ken Height says uh, his his favorite fantasy setting is Earth because he's like you just, you can't beat it. You, it's it, the, the the stuff that happens has happened on Earth is uh, the real world stuff is so unbelievable. Why would you go anywhere else? Uh, somebody asked, how did we settle on the title director for the person that sits behind behind the screen? Didn't it, it, it was not a point of enormous debate. I just thought about it. Oh. Dungeon master is a trademarked term, right? So we can't use yep. that. And we wouldn't anyway. We wouldn't anyway, even if we could, because this is not a game about exploring dungeons, uh, obviously. So That's we right. need something else. And I think <laughs> game master is a, a bit too generic. I'm not a huge fan of games that come up with names for the person that sits behind the screen just to be weird and different. Um, Nobilis, right? Where the person that sits behind the screen is the hollyhock god. Okay, that seemed like a bit tongue-in-cheek. I appreciate that. Uh, we just thought about, you know, and also, like I tell my therapist, um, I, I see the world through a lens of film. Like, it, it, like if, if we met in real life and we had a conversation about whatever it is you do for a living, a uh, person on the other side of the screen, um, I, would, I would probably go through all the movies I've watched and try to see how to relate to it, right? Um, so for me, calling it, you're the director. I, I, it it was, seemed like a no-brainer. Right. I can't think of I think it's a I, I can't think of any term that is more accurate and more insightful in describing what it is the person that sits behind. And but that also has a little bit to do a little bit to do with my perception of what a director on a film does. Um I do not I do not I don't know anybody anymore except maybe Elvis Mitchell subscribe to the auteur theory. Right? The auteur theory holds that a film is a work of art that springs fully blown from the director's mind like Athena from the head of Zeus. And I'm like, no, that's that's nonsense. That is not the success of 1977 Star Wars is not the success of George Lucas as a um as a author of film, it's a success of George Lucas as a collaborator, right? The, the, all the dialogue we quote, quote from Star Wars is Gloria Katz and William Huke. He didn't write, he, did, he wrote all the clunky dialogue that none of us like, right? He just didn't credit those folks, by the way. Uh, uncredited screenwriters, they were screenwriters on um, American Graffiti. They'd worked with him before. 
you know, uh, the, the reason Star Wars looks the way it does is because of a guy named John Dykstra. Go watch that ILM documentary. It's really good. It is, it's not a hagiography. It's not a, it's not a, it's not, it's, it's, it's very much warts and all, which is super surprising for an official Disney production. But that's John Dykstra made that happen. If George Lucas had never met that dude, that movie wouldn't exist, right? Uh, the reason the plot works the way it does is because of, Mar- of Marsha Lucas, right? The director is the manager. They manage it. They manage the. They manage everybody. They manage the writing. They manage the actors. They manage all this stuff. They're the. That's why Zack Snyder has a career. It's because studios like yep. working with the dude because he's a manager. He's not a visionary. He's a manager who has who gets movies done on time and on budget. And to a movie studio, that's a good movie. Five stars, two thumbs up, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's why we settled on director. It seemed it seemed obvious. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And I love that it is a collaborative title, right? Like, yes, the director is, is like you said, Madam Manager, but they're taking idea. I mean, watch any behind the scenes um, documentary about a, a, a thing well, or, or five minute YouTube video and you see that. It's awesome. Uh, it's one of the really, things really I learned term for this. was one of the things I learned in my professional career, somewhere between working for Last Unicorn and Pandemic, was that the skills necessary to be a good dungeon master or in our case director are very similar to the skills of being a good manager at work. Right. I remember my boss, Owen, um, who was the dev uh, lead, lead designer on the um, Dune card game and Dune role playing game. He was having a smoke break and uh, he, he, he told me straight up, he goes, every employee is here for a different reason, right? They're all here for different reasons. That means you got to all treat it. You, you, you can't, you can't treat all employees like they're interchangeable and they're all motivated by the same thing. Uh, uh-uh. They're all differently motivated, and it's your job to understand why are they here, what are they trying to get out of this relationship, so that you can be their best manager. And I was like, my God, that's exactly the same thing you do as a dungeon master, right? Every player at this table is here for a different reason. It's my job. And also stuff like I, stuff I learned about how like you, you don't just have to listen to what your players or your employees or your coworkers say. You have to listen to what they don't say, and that's a lot harder. But once you develop that skill, it gets really good. So for me, that director is just like, that's and I actually got um I actually went and bought one of these. Let's see what it is. I actually got dun, dun, dun. not not this. This is the re release of uh the classic tricky album on vinyl, which as you can see is still oh, nice. Matter. I got one of these. I just went I think it cost me like yeah. eleven bucks. Yeah. So that I can so that I can Call action. Uh, I can call. I can cut. Okay, cut. Let's wrap this up. Uh, you know, I might say, you know, draw, steal, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, maybe, maybe we'll make some of these and there'll be a fun prop. Anyway, uh, somebody asked, um, you mentioned Anthony Leutmer says, you mentioned Timescape being like Spelljammer, but has more Star Wars influences. Care to elaborate? I do not remember saying that because I don't really know anything about Spelljammer. I'm not in a position to say how well. I know that sounds crazy, but I saw Spelljammer products. Obviously, I've never played in a Spelljammer game. I think maybe my friend Craig might have run a Spelljammer game, but it would I, it only lasted a couple of sessions, if if that many. Um, and I think I might be confusing it with the Forgotten Realms. I think I think he might have run a Forgotten Realms game that he transitioned to. I don't know. I just remember. Um, but I never. I, I looked at those products and I I was like that the um, that fantasy doesn't appeal to me. And, and I think that had a lot to do with the just the art. Just the way they just the way they presented it. Um, to me, what I think of as the time scale is more like Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy, people would describe as science fiction, but there's nothing scientific about it at all. <laughs> it's not like um, yeah, it's not like uh, you know Babylon Five, uh, where the spaceships all behave or the Expanse is better rule, a uh, better example. The Expanse, where the spaceships obey the laws of physics and there's no gravity in space and there's no sound in space. Uh-uh. It's more like, you know, pew pew, dogfighting, gravity, sound in space, laser swords. You know, there's nothing scientific about a laser sword. I was seven when Star Wars came out and I already knew that's not possible. <laughs> you can't just have, that's not how light works, uh, dude. But that's not the point. You know, the point is it looks fucking cool. So it's more about that kind of swashbuckling, um, what I call, what we call space fantasy. And we've talked about it a lot. John Berkey, go, go look at John Berkey. Look that dude up, by the way. He's one of my all-time favorite artists. B-E-R-K-E-Y, not Berkeley, Berkey. Go look that dude up. That's the timescape. How you folks feel about how this stream is going, by the way? Um, 
I wanted to do a stream. I wanted to do another stream this week, hard on the heels of the last one, because I can't speak for James, but I was completely fried on. I, I, I honestly don't think I was entirely conscious on Friday when we were streaming. And I was like, oh man, and I watched it back and I was like, oh no, no, this is, this is pretty good. But I felt like, no, there's a, there's a better, there's a better Q and a stream out there. Um, and I think this one's, I think this one is better. So it's now one thirty. We've been streaming for 90 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I this feel one's going like great. Um, I appreciate all the questions and stuff. Thank you, everyone. So yeah, James streams once a week. I think that's, I think we're going to see a little bit of interruption in that process because it's the holidays. Everybody here at MCDM is going to take a couple of weeks off before the end of the crowdfunder. But uh, so don't be don't be surprised if all of a sudden there's radio silence. But we are trying to get some stuff. Hopefully, cross your fingers. Uh, like another one, one more, maybe more. I don't know. We'll find out. Ancestry spread preview for you folks as an update in backer kit before we go on vacation. If if that doesn't happen, don't freak out. It'll happen after. Um. So yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for asking great questions. Uh, and remember, like there are people in our Discord who have already been in a playtest and already played the game, and they would love to answer your questions. So if you're one of those, if, if if your question resembles one of those, I don't understand how you do this in in the MCDM game. Go to the Discord and ask them. Um, that's it, folks. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Jerry yeah. for setting all this up and making the stream work. Thanks for James to taking his time out of his uh, out of his day. Um, yeah. Cool. Of course. Awesome. Thank you, Matt, for being here, and thanks everybody for watching. Uh, Matt, I, oh, no I think that you should probably grab that clapboard to bring us out. That's right. I, it's up to Jerry to time it right, but that's it. We're going to call...